Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the uh, SNMMI Annual Patient Education Day. My name is Mike Crosby. I'm a retired Navy commander and founder of C and CEO of Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness. We're a nonprofit organization focused on raising awareness and educating veterans about prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment options. I'd like to thank SNMMI for organizing this prostate cancer focused patient education event. This is the 10th year that SNMMI has held Patient Education Day and the second time it has been done virtually. <clears throat> so much has happened in nuclear medicine in the recent years and we look forward to sharing with you the newest developments as well as a brief look into the future. Today's session is the second of the uh, Patient Education Day events. The remaining events will be held next Saturday, August 28th, and will address the latest in breast cancer and nuclear medicine. Our schedule for today starts with a 20 minute session offering an introduction to nuclear medicine and radiation safety, followed by three speakers who will specifically address prostate cancer diagnosis and treatment. Following that, we'll have a Q&A period. I please ask everyone to participate in the Q&A. Our speakers will join us at the end and take part in the Q&A session to answer any questions that you might have. If you would like to submit a question, please use the Q&A application here on our platform at www.slido.com slash pedprostate. I think uh, if you're here, you'll see it. It's the, uh, the little button off to the right-hand side uh, of your controls and then enter a question into the chat room there. This event is produced under the direction of SNMMI's Patient Advocacy Advisory Board, which includes representations from 14 different disease-specific advocacy groups. A note to any physician or technicians or nurses that are joining us today, we're also, we're so pleased to have you, but please note there are no continuing education credits uh, being offered for today's session. And for the patients, please note that this webinar is for educational purposes only. Please discuss any treatment options or considerations with your healthcare providers and your team. Finally, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to thank our event sponsors wouldn't happen without them. Uh, you'll find them listed on the website at snmmi.org slash PED, where you can also find some excellent patient materials that have been provided for this event focused on prostate cancer and nuclear medicine. Our industry sponsors today are Advanced Accelerator Applications, Blue Earth Diagnostics, ITM, GE, and Lantheus Medical Imaging. I want to point out that all sessions are being taped and SNMMI plans to place an edited version on their website uh, shortly after the conclusion of today's uh, discussions. So let's get started. Our first speaker uh, we're honored to have is Dr. John Sunderland from the University of Iowa. Dr. Sunderland serves as director of the university's Pet Imaging Center and is a professor of radiology in the division of nuclear medicine a professor of radiation oncology, and a professor of physics and astronomy. Busy guy. He also is chair of SNMMI's research and discovery domain and co-chair of its clinical trials network. He's going to share an overview of nuclear medicine, molecular imaging, and radiation safety. So please, everybody, welcome Dr. Sunderland, and take it over, Dr. Sunderland. Hi, uh, my name is John Sunderland. Uh, I'm a medical physicist at the University of Iowa. And I'm gonna spend the next, uh, next 15, 20 minutes or so going over uh, what nuclear medicine is with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of radiation safety uh, kind of folded in towards the end. So here's a roadmap of where we're going. Um, we're gonna start just with a very brief uh, uh, comparison between anatomic imaging uh, as compared to what nuclear medicine and molecular imaging is all about. Uh, then we're going to get into what nuclear medicine actually is and how it works. Uh, we're going to go uh, to what nuclear medicine is used for. We're going to do some diagnostic applications and therapeutic applications, which is a new, uh, new and upcoming uh, er and exciting area, and then follow with some radiation safety considerations just at the very end. So to start off just for context here, um, what you see on the left-hand side of the screen are four very common anatomic imaging techniques that you're familiar with. So for example, MRI in the upper left really is uh, an image of the hydrogen density in your body. Uh, if you go to angiography right next to that, you inject just a little bit of, uh, of radioactive opaque 
uh, liquid into the veins and you can get exquisite, very high resolution uh, uh, images of the vascular, vas vascular churn in the heart and, and other places by passing x-rays through it. If you look at CT down in the lower left, that's taking x-rays that are go going through the body at about a thousand different angles. We can put those together to create highly detailed anatomical uh, images, which you see there. Uh, ultrasound uses ultrasound waves that reflect back, uh, give you real-time images, for example, of, 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 of fetuses and babies. But all of this stuff looks at anatomy in the human body. Uh, whereas what we have in the area of molecular imaging is we're actually looking at function. We're looking at biochemistry. What you see on the left-hand side uh, is an image of glucose metabolism. So we're not looking at structure here so much as we are, ooh, look at the brain. The brain has a lot of activity. The heart has a lot of activity. If you look uh, more importantly in the chest, you can see the tumor where you have cells that are dividing rapidly. They're metabolizing glucose rapidly. So we can see very clearly what that is and distinguish what might be a cyst or, or, or some other lump from actual active tumor. If you look in the upper right, we have a brain scan, which is distinguishing uh, a normal normal brain. We're looking at dopamine storage here on the left, Parkinson's disease on the right. Anatomically, these two structures look the same on an MRI or a CT, uh, but here we can see very clearly that the function is compromised. And if you look down below that, we're looking at perfusion uh, of the heart, what parts of the heart are actually getting blood. We're looking at function here. So on the left-hand side, anatomy, right side function, which is our, our nuclear medicine molecular imaging biz. So we're going to go from there and get into what is nuclear medicine and how does it work. So in all cases, when we do a nuclear medicine study, we are administering a tiny, tiny quantity of drug uh, that has a radioactive atom attached so we can trace its path through the body. So what you see here on the left is a molecule, it's a glucose molecule again, that happens to have a fluorine 18, a radioactive atom attached. This is like my kids, they carry around cell phones and I can track where they go all over town because the, the cell phone is, is transmitting radio waves and, and the like, such that I can see, see where they are. Similarly, when we get radioactive decay, we can place where that molecule is in the body. So we are tracing where the glucose goes in the body over time. Now, what we're doing is we're injecting a tiny quantity and when I say tiny, I mean tiny. When we do one of these studies with this radioactive glucose, we're injecting about a millionth of a single grain of radioactive sugar. So the mass quantity is small. There's almost no possibility for side effects or anything like that. This is a tracer methodology. And then we use special scanners uh, to detect the gamma rays from the nucleus of the radioactive atom. Now, we're not doing mm -hmm. magic here, uh, and we're not doing anything unnatural. We're using what Mother Nature gave to us. You're probably all familiar with the periodic table you'll see here and all familiar with uh, with carbon, um, which we see here. There's two stable isotopes of carbon, carbon-12 and carbon-13. Mm -hmm. But if we put one extra neutron into that nucleus, we end up with carbon-14, which is radioactive. It's unstable. It decays with a half-life of about 5,000 years. And this is what we use for carbon dating. If we take a neutron away, uh, then we end up with carbon-11. We now have too few neutrons and too many protons. It's unstable. This has a half-life of 20 minutes, very unstable, um, but we can use this and image it with positron emission tomography. And in fact, what you see in the lower right here is an image of C11-choline, which allows us to, uh, to detect prostate cancer quite sensitively. You can see in the, in the kind of in the in the groin area, a little tiny dot, which is where a hidden uh, prostate cancer is metastasized. So this is just to give you a little bit of a, of a harbinger of where, uh, where you're going to be going in this invention, not just this, but other, uh, other talks that are coming. Uh, we're going to look at radiopharmaceuticals because in nuclear medicine, we only see what our molecules are targeting. And so what we have on the left is F18 fluoroestradiol, FES, which is very specific for not, not only breast cancer, but estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, which will help a physician guide a particular kind of therapy that will be effective to patients who have this particular kind of breast cancer. In the middle, we have F18 DCFPYL. This is a PSMA prostate cancer imaging agent, recently approved just as FES was on the, pre, on the just to the left. This was just recently approved, a highly, highly sensitive way to detect the spread of prostate cancer. 
this is going to be a game changer in the way uh, the way prostate cancer is managed. This too was just recently approved and is, is hitting the market. And on the right is Copter C Copper 64 Dotatate. We've had Dotatates approved before, but not with Copper 64. Copper 64 is different because instead of a half-life of an hour or two, it has a half-life of two uh, 12 hours, which means they can make it centrally in St. Louis and they can ship it by FedEx anywhere in the country, even up as far as Alaska. It'll be there the next day. And so now everybody has access to this, which is used for somatostatin receptor imaging and neuroendocrine tumors. Once again, highly specific to cancers and to, to molecules. Going to go very briefly over the three kinds of radioactive decay. There's negative beta decay when there are too many neutrons. There's positron decay when there's too many protons. And there's alpha decay, which we're not going to discuss today. There's really only three of them. The particles that they emit, they only, it's just an electron or a positron, they really only go a millimeter or so. We don't worry about those so much. Uh, but we almost in all cases get a gamma ray at the same time. And gamma rays are very penetrating. They go way more than a millimeter. And they can actually make it outside of the body where we detect them with our scanners. And if they're positron emitters, because they have too many protons, not enough neutrons, we use a PET scanner. If they detect, if they uh, decay by beta decay, we use, we use a SPECT scanner, which is below. PET is usually a little bit higher resolution and a little bit higher sensitivity, but they're both highly useful and both uh, great imaging. So this is how it works. We generally inject in the arm, although in the center video, you can actually see it being injected in the, in the foot. And you could actually see how, and this is what happens when we inject one of these radioactive uh, radio pharmaceuticals into the body. It goes into the vein, it goes to the heart, it goes to the lung, it spreads to the different organs, uh, to whatever physiology that that molecule is supposed to go to. So this is going to start again in a minute, and we'll look at it again. But then on the right, we image. The imaging takes on the order of 15 minutes on a PET scan, 30 minutes on a SPECT. So once again, if you see this going up, you see it going into the, into the lungs, into the heart, going into the rest of the blood, so it can be delivered. Uh, here we're just, we're only one minute out right now. And pretty soon you're going to see it start go, starting to go into the kidneys. The kidneys are getting it. It's filtering it out. The bladder just filled up. It's going to the heart. You can see the brain is using the glucose. You can see the heart is using the glucose. Uh, but if it were a different agent, the distribution would be different. And, and that's what we do. So going to launch from here into what nuclear medicine is used for. So I'm going to go through some diagnostic applications current and, uh, and, and upcoming, and then some therapeutic applications, which are, uh, which are also uh, actually quite exciting and, and game changing. This is just a brief slide with some bread and butter stuff that the uh, imaging, nuclear medicine imaging things that we've been doing for, for decades, frankly. Uh, we've been doing the cancer imaging with FDG and PET. Uh, we look for cardiovascular disease using SPECT imaging or PET imaging. Um, I'm showing this pulmonary embolism imaging because on the left-hand side, uh, this is one we don't inject. This is a radioactive gas that we inhale. We use that in combination with an injectant uh, dose to see A, where air is getting, and B, where blood is getting, and we use that together. On the right-hand side, uh, we're looking at, once again, the movement disorders, but we can look at amyloid imaging uh, with Alzheimer's disease, uh, et cetera. Um, these are all exciting but old. What I'm going to briefly go over now are things you're going to learn about in a little bit more detail in, in subsequent talks. But I just want to introduce you, first of all, to this F18-FES, which I mentioned before. This is fluoroestradiol. This was just recently approved within about the last year or so. It's used in the detection of estrogen receptor positive lesions as an adjunct to biopsy in patients with recurrent metastatic breast cancer. This helps guide the physician to the appropriate treatment for this particular patient. Uh, it is uh, approved by FDA and it is also being reimbursed. Here we're talking, we're going to go through the next two are both PSMA prostate cancer imaging agents. This first one is gallium 68 PSMA. Uh, this is uh, approved, although it's only commercially available through the University of California, San Francisco and UCLA at this point in time. They're the ones who submitted the application to the FDA. So those are the people that are approved, although there are academic institutions, the University of Iowa is one of them, who continue to perform these studies under uh, an FDA-approved mechanism, an IND, on a temporary basis until we get access to these commercial agents, because FDA wants people to have access uh, to drugs that are, that are safe and effective. Uh, this is approved, uh, and it is reimbursed by CMS and generally by private insurers, but you generally, uh, as in all of these agents, you pretty much need pre-approval. 
Uh, this is a similar PSMA agent for prostate cancer. This one is labeled with F18. F18 has a half-life of two hours as compared with gallium 68 with one. This one is much more easily transported uh, from central production. Um, this is, uh, and, and it's not a university that submitted this, it's the company. Uh, this is newly approved just within the last few months. Um, it's available now in some major pet metropolitan areas and the availability is rapidly expanding. As I said, this is going to be a game changer for prostate cancer management. And here, as I mentioned, is the copper 64 dotatate. Gallium 68 dotatate has been approved. This does functionally exactly the same thing. The point here is this is available nationwide. They can get it to any hospital uh, that's licensed, uh, that's actually licensed to have it uh, in, in the country. And that's, uh, that's exciting and a big boon to the neuroendocrine tumor uh, community. And the last one I'm going to point out, these are three brain imaging agents, Alzheimer's uh, disease uh, agents that, that image amyloid. These have been approved, frankly, for almost a decade, but they haven't been used because Medicare, CMS does not reimburse for them. They don't reimburse, not because they don't work, but because there is no therapeutic out there for Alzheimer's disease. Now, with the tentative approval of, of, a, of, a, of a drug, Adjahelm, uh, that you've probably heard about in the newspaper, it is possible that these are going to uh, be seeing widespread use to make sure a patient actually does have Alzheimer's disease before they have access to that very, uh, very expensive therapeutic drug. And there are other good therapeutic drugs that are in the pipeline right now that are doing functionally, uh, functionally the same thing. So uh, this is another area of nuclear medicine imaging where it might manifest itself in order to, uh, uh, to help with management of patients in a very common uh, and devastating disease. I want to just spend a minute on therapeutic applications here. Um, so we don't just diagnose with nuclear medicine, we can actually do therapy. Now, fundamentally, we know that very large doses of radiation can kill cells or at the very least damage the DNA so it can't divide anymore. Uh, this is the foundation of external beam radiation therapy that's been a, a staple of cancer therapeutics for, for more than 50 years now. But it kind of makes you think. Because here on the left-hand side is a gallium 68 uh, Dota, Dota Tate scan. So this is a patient with widely metastatic disease um, in, in the body. You, there's no way that you can do surgery on a patient like this or, or anything. What you really like to do is to target just the tumors, which is exactly what this gallium 68 is doing. It's going straight to the tumors and almost nowhere else. So it makes you think, what if instead of injecting a tiny bit of gallium 68 dotatate, you injected a lot of lutetium-177 dotatate, same molecule, same targeting, but lutetium-177 has a half-life of about a week. So what happens here is the radiation goes to the tumors, it sits in the tumors for a week or two and blasts the, the, the tumors, the, the, uh, the neuroendocrine tumors that they're bound to with radiation to the point where hopefully you give the tumors a lethal dose and what you end up with is a patient who in this case is virtually disease free. Um, this is almost like magic. Not all patients respond like this, of course, but this is a very effective way to treat metastatic disease. Neuroendocrine tumors are an orphan indication, which means there are not a whole lot of those. Prostate cancer uh, is a is a much more common uh, a common disease. Um, just to just to to follow up, lutetium one seventy seven dotatate was approved in twenty eighteen and it is being used all over the country now for the therapy of neuroendocrine tumors. But moving on to PSMA um, for prostate cancer, once again we have this imaging agent that goes very specifically to the tumors. So the question is, ooh, what happens if we label it with a long lived radionuclide, lutetium-177, with that half-life of, of almost a week, and we inject a lot of it. So here are six cases, A, B, C, D, E, and F. In the first image, you see in red where the, the gallium imaging agent shows where the tumor was. And then in B, you can see after therapy uh, what the response was. So once again, the first three, you see the disease almost completely eradicated. Uh, in D, E, and F, you see partial response, but certainly dramatic, uh, dramatic response. And so this is all, uh, all exciting. Um, this is not approved yet, uh, but the phase three trial, the one that they're going to use to try and get it approved, has functionally completed. They've done their preliminary analysis, and they have met 
their statistical endpoints of prolonged overall survival of patients who receive this treatment. So they will be applying to FDA, and I wouldn't be surprised if in a year or so that this will be available uh, to, to the general population, which is, uh, which is a huge step forward. Uh, lastly, just spending a couple minutes on radiation safety considerations, uh, just with regard to nuclear medicine. Um, I just want to let you know we're all being exposed to background radiation even as we speak. Cosmic rays from space are coming down. We have radioactivity in Earth. We have radioactivity inside our bodies and as well as the radon that, that, that's in our basement. Um, we know about how much radiation we get. We get about one millirem per day uh, just from background radiation. So if we bear that in mind, we get one per day just in general. I want to put that into context. So one per day is background, not harmful. Uh, if we go up to 500,000 of those units of radiation dose, your whole body at once, that can cause acute harm and even death. So uh, that's, that's on the high side. If we go down a factor of 10 to 50,000 millirem, bearing in mind we get one per day, and we get that all at once, then we believe we can see a very, very slight increase in the downstream risk of cancer. It's not a sure thing. In fact, it's, it's only barely blip above the, the normal cancer incidence rate. Um, uh, but that's about our level of detectability. Maybe we might be able to go down to 40,000 and, and detect a little bit of, of an increase there, which is why we go down a factor of 10 still to go 5,000 millirem per year, which is what we believe is safe for radiation safety workers at hospitals in nuclear power plants and stuff to be exposed to. So the technologists that are doing your scans, they're radiation workers, and uh, at least at the pet center here, our uh, technologists get on the order of 1,000, 1,500 millirem per year, which by the way is on the high end of what patients get for a, uh, for a single nuclear medicine procedure. We conservatively assume that even though we can't detect an increased rate of cancer at these low, low rates, we conservatively assume that maybe they can. So, so we, we, we just assume that less radiation to the patient uh, is always preferable as long as we get the right information out. Okay? This is just putting this all into context. Uh, for a chest x-ray, you get about 10 millirem. That's about 10 days of background radiation. And for a nuclear medicine thyroid scan, you get approximately the same thing. On the other end of the spectrum, for a FDG, uh, that's a, one of those glucose PET scans, along with a CT study at the same time, you'll get between 1,000 and, and 2,000 millirem or so, which, as I, as I mentioned before, that's about what our technologists get over the course, over the course of the year, still well within our, within our safety margins. So that's the kind of range that we're talking about for, uh, for clinical scans. How much radiation would be considered too much in the grand scheme of things? Well, in our biz, the answer is more than is necessary. We don't want to give more than that. In all cases, these are prescribed drugs when we inject these radioactive uh, radiopharmaceuticals into you. And the benefit of the imaging study far outweighs any potential risk. Each of the imaging procedures takes a certain amount of radiation to perform appropriately. This is well studied. We know what that is. Using too much radiation dose, it leads to unnecessarily radiation dose to the patient. But using too little may not provide enough information, which may be harmful in and of itself. If we're too worried about radiation, we don't give you enough, and our images are cruddy, and we don't detect the cancer that we're trying to see, then we're actually doing harm by not giving, uh, giving you enough radiation dose. So each imaging procedure is optimized for the medical question the equipment being used, and the patient, and this is what is practiced universally in the United States. Uh, the SNMMI uh, has initiated two dose optimization campaigns, the Image Gently and the Image Wisely campaign, uh, one's for children, one's for adults, and both of these promote the appropriate procedure for that specific patient with the minimum amount of radiation dose necessary to provide the useful information that we're trying to get. Uh, SNMI has a web page on these topics. It's snmmi.org slash dose if you are interested in such things. Um, and with that, I think I will conclude, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the program uh, and the rest of your day. Thank you.
Well, thanks, uh, Dr. Sunderland. Uh, what an amazing review of an introduction to nuclear medicine and uh, takes me back and reminds me of all my phys physics classes at the Naval Academy and uh, what we had to learn about uh, you know, nuclear power, but uh, quite a different application. This was an excellent introduction, introduction to the uh, nuclear medicine topic. And a quick reminder that uh, all of these questions that you might have or you might, might want to put into the presentation will be answered uh, at the end of the show here. Next, we're going to move on to our, uh, our next speaker who's going to address nuclear medicine as it specifically rates the diagnosis and management of prostate cancer. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a friend and, uh, and also um, part of my care team, Dr. Golan Baranji, from the West Los Angeles VA Medical Center and also with UCLA. Dr. Baranji is a nuclear medicine physician uh, with more than 20 years of experience and sits on the board of directors for SNMMI's Correlative Imaging Council. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for SNMMI uh, Patient Education Day. My name is uh, Reza Berenji. I'm a professor of radiology at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Today, I'm going to discuss a little bit about uh, a nuclear medicine a physician uh, perspective about prostate cancer. Um, in the past uh, several years, uh, I had the privilege to to work with a uh, very great uh, scientist uh, working on prostate cancer, and I'm going to discuss some of our experiences and some of our knowledge we gain with you today. Uh, here's my disclosures. Uh, so. I'm going to speak a little bit about the different uh, imaging modalities today. Of course, there are uh, many great uh, imaging modalities available uh, for evaluation of prostate cancer, but my focus today is mainly on uh, the uh, two major nuclear medicine modalities, bone scan and uh, positron emission tomography or PET scan. A little bit about bone scan, how is it done? It's usually most of these imaging studies that we do in nuclear medicine starts with an IV line and an injection of a radio tracer that is tagged with some uh, radioactive agent that we are able to evaluate and see the radiation and activity in, in patient's body. So other imaging uh, with nuclear medicine bone scan starts with the injection of a radio tracer. The main uh, radio tracer we're using is MDP, is a phosphonate. Uh, so after injection, we usually wait about three or more hours, in some instances less than that, and then we scan the patient. Bone scan, as it describes, uh, shows what is going on with the skeletal system, and I have some examples of it. So as you see in, in these images, uh, we have a image of a person that has uh, a normal scan and on the other side you see the scan with a lot of uh, black dots and black areas so bone scan allows us to evaluate how the skeletal system looks in addition to that it shows some of the soft tissues as well in prostate cancer in majority of patients with newly diagnosed prostate cancer with high-risk prostate cancer a bone scan is usually done for evaluation of any uh, potential metastatic disease. And through the course of the disease, if uh, there is an elevation in the PSA and other suspicions for possibility of metastatic disease to the bone, the patient may get additional bone scans. And additionally, after treatment, a bone scan can be used for treatment response in many patients. Our next modality, uh, is PET scan, positron emission tomography. In PET scan, we use, we have choice of uh, different radio tracers. Um, I'm gonna speak more about the process specific membrane antigen uh, radio tracer today. This is a newly approved uh, by FDA. Additionally, there is fluocyclovine, uh, sodium fluoride, and some other uh, tracers. So, PSMA, PET-CT, uh, or prostate-specific membrane antigen, PET-CT, uh, has been used for many years uh, around the world. Uh, we've been fortunate this year that had the uh, benefit of approval of two different radio tracer, including gallium-68, uh, PSMA-11, and 18F-DCF-P. 
people here, which I speak a little bit more about them. Again, like uh, bone scan, the PET CT, but PSMA also is done by placing an IV line and injecting the radio tracer, and then you usually wait about an hour. The PSMA is a uh, scan that shows both the soft tissue, the lymph node, the, the prostate itself, also the bone lesion and bone uh, dissemination of disease to the bone. So when it's usually done, now this is a, a subject of uh, new uh, studies uh, because this is just recently approved. We don't have uh, exact guidelines, uh, but in the past three years, uh, we've been uh, I've been involved in research in PSMA scans and. Uh, we've been doing it both in uh, newly diagnosed uh, uh, diagnosed high-risk prostate cancer for eval initial evaluation of any metastatic disease in patient before they decide on their next step, what kind of therapy approach they're, they're going to do. And also uh, in patients with uh, biochemical recurrence, uh, which means if they're shown increase in prostate-specific antigen levels, and there was concern about metastatic disease, and then we did PSMA scan. So I have some examples of uh, first uh, with uh, 18F DCF PYL, which was recently approved by the FDA. It may not be yet available in your area, but hopefully soon it will be available. It's a great, great scan, great uh, radio tracer. And as you see, we have a normal subject here with uh, a normal distribution of uh, tracer it will go to the salivary glands liver spleen and it got it uh, also it gets uh, excreted through the uh, kidneys and also through the gi or gastrointestinal tract and on the other side we see uh, another patient uh, with uh, dark areas uh, it's uh, those are the areas that uh, shows uptake in the bone and some lymph nodes in the pelvis. So as you see, this is a very clear image that we can easily detect any metastatic disease, any spread of disease to the bone or to soft tissue. Another great PSMA radio tracer is gallium, 68 gallium PSMA 11. That has also been used uh, for many years uh, outside of the United States and also has been approved by uh, FDA for use at uh, UCLA and UCSF. Gallium-68 PSMA is uh, similar to uh, DCF-PYL, and uh, they're both uh, great tracers. This is an example of a patient with several areas of metastases. As you said, the salivary glands and liver and kidneys, are all, those are normal areas, but additionally, in the areas in the pelvis and uh, in the abdomen and in the spinal column and ribs, there are several regions of metastases that are, those are the dark areas. So as you see that these two radio tracer, hopefully are gonna be more available in the United States and uh, help patients and uh, physicians to make a good decision for the next step in therapy of patient. So another Radio tracer for evaluation of uh, prostate cancer is flociclovin, and it is done similar to uh, other imaging that I've covered, with an exception that uh, the scan, uh, the injection is done under the camera because we want to start the scan almost immediately after the injection to prevent uh, any activity, appearance of any activity um, in the bladder and urinary tract. Uh, so uh, it basically shows where this is a amino acid and it shows where the cancer cells are making uh, are more active and make using those uh, amino acids and I have an example of it it is usually done when there is a suspicion of metastatic disease in patient with already treated prostate cancer and these are the, I put it side by side, this is the same patient that had a 18 flociclovin and about two weeks later had a DCF-PYL study. 
And as you see, the two scans show similar areas, except that the background is cleaner on DCF-PYL. They're basically working on different principles, but uh, helping to detect a metastatic disease. Uh, the two scans are compared in this uh, particular patient. We see a little bit more on the DCF-PYL. It has a cleaner background. And in some studies showed that it works better, but there are other studies that uh, showing flocyclovine is also a good tracer. Another tracer that we use frequently in our practice is uh, 18F uh, sodium fluoride. This is not widely used uh, for various reasons, but uh, in our practice, we use it uh, as a standard uh, bone scan. This is basically a PET-based bone scan. It is done by injection of the radio tracer through an IV line. Uh, the wait time is about uh, 40 minutes to an hour, and the scan is pretty quick. And as uh, you can see in these images, as uh, uh, we move towards the, uh, the right, uh, the first one is a patient with very little activity, abnormal activities. And as we move to the right, uh, the degree of metastatic disease increases and unfortunately the last patient is a disseminated disease so the major differences between the sodium fluoride PET scan and the bone scan is uh, the ability of a 3d scanning on the PET scan and a more detail-oriented evaluation of the bones now there are many other PET tracers around uh, some are FDA approved uh, some are used in a special circumstances there is uh, C11 choline, and in some cases we use uh, fluorodeoxy glucose or FDG, dorotate, and uh, other tracers, which uh, is not the mainstream, but in uh, particular cases can be used, and your physician probably direct you if it's uh, needed. Now, uh, I just wanted to uh, point out uh, to resources that are available to you if you go back to, to the patient education day when you where you registered on the right side under the patient resources there are several good links that you can click and learn more about uh, some of the radio tracer and some of the items i covered in this lecture now i'm just going to uh, talk a little bit very briefly about the therapies uh, uh, that are available through nuclear medicine and the first uh, item is uh, therapies for metastatic bone disease. Unfortunately, prostate cancer in some patients goes to the bone and causes bone pain. And uh, there, in addition to other medical therapies, uh, we can offer uh, radio tracers that uh, alleviate the pain. And in some cases, like uh, radium decolorate, they can even reduce the burden of uh, metastatic disease. So these are the 153 samarium, 223 radium decolorate, and 89 strontium uh, colorite are the three mainstream uh, available radio tracers for uh, therapy of uh, bone disease. Uh, lastly, and uh, maybe uh, some of, uh, one of the exciting things is targeted therapy or teranostic for uh, prostate cancer. We've been fortunate to be part of a vision trial that was recently finished and showed interesting results and uh, very promising results about uh, therapy with uh, PSMA 617. And there are other studies uh, uh, looking into other tracer like 225 actinium based PSMA therapies. And this was the result of the vision trial that was recently published in. Uh, New England Journal of Medicine with some promising uh, findings. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for participating today and uh, hope that you uh, learned and enjoyed our uh, talk today and uh, would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Branji. Uh, reminder, please put your questions in the box uh, and we'll uh, get to those uh, at the, after two more lectures. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nick Nichols, who is also from the Los Angeles VA Medical Center and UCLA. Dr. Nichols is a radiation oncology specialist uh, and will share 
the oncologist perspective with respects to this uh, this PSMA and uh, and new imaging that's going on. Thank you very much. It's my absolute pl pleasure to be here and present today on the role of nuclear medicine in prostate cancer. My name is Nick Nichols and I'm a radiation oncologist at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System and UCLA. So a little background about the prostate gland and prostate cancer. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this already. But prostate cancer can be expected to affect about one in eight men in the United States. When you think about that, that's quite a lot, actually. And in fact, about more than 200,000 incidence cases each year are diagnosed in the United States, as well as 30,000 men will unfortunately pass from prostate cancer in a given year. The prostate gland is located in the pelvis, as you can see here. It is beneath the bladder and in front of the rectum. And some other detailed anatomy is shown there. But I wanted to give some background here and that the location of the prostate in the pelvis. But what's also important, if you're a patient and you're a physician and you, you want to know where else is the cancer? Is it right in the prostate or is it somewhere else? And that's really uh, the focus of imaging. So first, we're going to talk about the role of nuclear medicine in prostate cancer staging. Accurate staging leads to the most appropriate treatments for prostate cancer. So in this slide, we essentially outline the general treatment strategies for prostate cancer. And the big take home message is the best initial treatment really depends on the extent of the disease. And this can range from the disease being only in the prostate all the way to the prostate in many different places in the body. So if the cancer is in the prostate only, there's many options. One of them may include active surveillance. That means you don't treat the cancer now, you watch it closely and maybe at some point in the future decide to treat it. This is appropriate for prostate cancers that are not particularly aggressive or other reasons in certain cases. Alternatively, one can undergo surgery, which is radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy with or without hormonal therapy. And these are curative intent treatments. And whether or not you add hormone therapy or whether or not you add radiation after surgery, this depends really on the aggressiveness of the prostate cancer. Now, it may be that the prostate cancer is in the prostate, but also in nearby pelvic lymph nodes. So I mentioned the prostate's in the pelvis, and it's possible for the cancer to migrate out of the prostate into the nearby lymph nodes. This changes how you treat the cancer. This changes the outcome for the patient, depending on the treatment. And in this case, typically radiation therapy and likely escalated versions of hormonal therapy are indicated. Now, it may also be that the cancer is in the prostate as well as some distant lymph nodes or even in a bone. And this also changes things. In this case, the systemic therapy, which is basically hormone therapy that's typically escalated, is the central treatment and may also involve radiation treatments to the primary tumor in the prostate. Now, it may also be that the cancer is in the prostate as well as many different distant organs, even visceral organs beyond lymph nodes and bone. And in this case, again, the primary treatment is systemic hormone therapy that may actually be combined with chemotherapy. The big message here is we need to know where the cancer is in order to determine what the best treatment is. So how do you find out where the prostate cancer is? Well, you image. And here is the typical conventional imaging that has been used for prostate cancer for quite some time. The bones have been typically imaged with bone scans, technetium 99 bone scans. That's really been the workhorse scan for a long time. Soft tissues, this includes lymph nodes and other uh, soft organs, have been typically imaged by CT scans or MRIs and particular focuses on the pelvis and abdomen. And the prostate itself is best imaged with multi-parametric MRI. And on this slide, you can see examples of these image modalities on the right side. The top is the bone scan. The middle is a CT scan. That's a cross section of the pelvis. The bottom is a MRI of the prostate. Now, there's limitations to these scans. So as I mentioned, conventional bone scans have really been the primary method to image bones and prostate cancer, but there's limitations to them. Their sensitivity is low. And what that means is you can miss. There can be areas where the cancer is, but you just don't see it on the scan. And that's important. Also, the specificity is fairly low. That means you could see something on the scan, but it's not necessarily related to the prostate cancer. 
So clearly there has been a need for improved imaging of bones in prostate cancer. Now, fortunately, over the last 10 years, a lot has happened. You know, 10 years goes by like the blink of an eye. Uh, and sometimes a lot of things happen. And fortunately, that has been the case for imaging of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer has gone from one of the worst imaged cancers to one of the best in this time period. Choline PET-CT was approved in about 2012. So this is a nuclear medicine scan that uses labeled uh, choline derivatives to image metabolism that is fairly specific for what goes on in prostate cancer cells. Later on, flucyclovine, flucyclovine PET-CT, another type of PET scan that actually also images different kind of metabolism that also goes on in prostate cancer cells. And these are both uh, improvements upon the conventional imaging that we have typically used. Then more recently, PSMA PET-CT, that stands for prostate-specific membrane antigen PET-CT, has recently been approved. Currently, there's two versions of PSMA PET, and they're both very similar to each other, and they both work exceptionally well. And on the bottom, you can see the accuracy of the scans. And you can see that over time, they have gotten better. I admit this is not a quantitative assessment, but it is uh, fairly accurate. Here's an example of a bone scan versus a PSMA PET CT. On the left side there, the far left, is a technetium bone scan. Right to the right of that, you see the PSMA PET. And you can see the arrows there where you're looking at lesions in the bone that you didn't see on the conventional bone scan. That makes a difference. As I mentioned before, where the cancer is really plays a critical role in the treatments that are most appropriate. And on the far right there, you kind of get a zoomed in view of what you're actually seeing on the PSMA PET scan. You can see lesions in the ribs there that really you couldn't see on the bone scan, nor could you see on the CT scan without the PET fusion. That that pink glow there is the fusion of the PET. And the bottom line is the accuracy is superior for detection of lesions in bone with PSMA PET than for conventional bone scans. The same holds true actually when you're imaging uh, soft tissue, uh, including lymph nodes. Here is an example of that, in fact. So this is comparing CT scan versus the fusion PET CT scan with a PSMA tracer. And on the top there, on the left, you see the CT alone. And on the right, you see the PSMA PET fusion to that. And you can see a right pelvic lymph node that was not evident at all on the CT scan, but clearly evident on the PET scan. As I mentioned before, that makes a difference in treatment. You're going to offer this patient a different treatment, the one that's more appropriate and that's more likely to cure them, in fact. In the middle, you can see an example of both a lymph node and a bone lesion. You can see on the left side on the CT, you can't see it. On the right side, you see that faint glow in the sacrum that's clearly evident on the PET fusion there as well as another lymph node on the right side of the pelvis with the blue arrow. Again, whether or not the cancer has migrated to bone, a bone metastasis, this changes management. This changes the optimal treatment for the patient. In the bottom, you can actually see the primary tumor. Now on the left side on the CT, you just see kind of a blob where the prostate is. On the right side, you can actually see the tumors there in the prostate in the peripheral zone on the right side. As I mentioned before, and this kind of elucidates very clearly, accurate imaging leads to more appropriate treatments. So shown here is a CT on the left and a PSMA PET CT on the right. Let's say you had only the CT. Well, this patient is, let's say they have uh, localized prostate cancer and it's high risk or intermediate risk. Then based on the imaging you have available, you classify them as having disease in the prostate and nowhere else. And the plan would be either prostatectomy of surgery or radiation therapy with or without hormone therapy. Now, if you fuse the PSMA PET, you can see that the situation has changed considerably. You can see a bone lesion, that's the middle on the right side. You can see a lymph node as well, as well as the primary tumor. Turns out that if you had done prostatectomy or radiation alone, this would have been inadequate treatment for this patient. So accurately, the patient actually has disease both in the prostate and the lymph nodes, as well as at least one bone lesion. So you're able to offer the patient a more comprehensive treatment, more likely to control their disease. This would include escalated hormone therapy, tumor-directed therapy, and uh, because they have metastatic disease in this case, we would also offer germline and somatic tumor sequencing. So this basically illustrates how incorporation of biologic imaging of PSMA PET-CT, which is a nuclear medicine scan, really makes a huge impact on you know, what treatment is selected. 
So next we're going to get a little bit more technical here and talk about the role of uh, nuclear medicine in prostate cancer radiation planning. I am a radiation oncologist and this is what I do and I can tell you that integration of PSMA PET into the process of radiation planning really enables more accurate, more precise, more tailored cancer therapy. So I do admit this slide is a little busy, but this is a slide that kind of gives an overview of part of what it means to be a radiation oncologist. So in the case of prostate cancer, when the, uh, the patient has prostate cancer and it's in the prostate to the best of our knowledge to determine, um, and we're going to offer radiation therapy, we actually delineate and draw out volumes that we want to receive radiation. And you can see that on the top there. You can see it basically outlines the prostate. We also outline places where we don't want the radiation to go. For example, the bladder, the rectum, and other nearby organs. Now, on the bottom, we see an example where a patient has already had their prostate removed, but has had a recurrence, as evidenced by a, likely a PSA rise. And so we can offer what's called salvage radiation, where we aim the radiation at essentially the place where the prostate used to be, as well as often pelvic lymph nodes uh, nearby the prostate. Now, the point that I want to make here is that we're drawing these volumes essentially without an obvious target. You know, on the top, we're drawing it around the prostate. And yes, we know the cancer is in the prostate, but where exactly we don't know is it also in lymph nodes. We can't often tell that without integration of the, Im the imaging from PSMA PET. Likewise, in the case of uh, post-prostatectomy radiation. Now, here's an example where on the top we have CT and we have the tracings of the volumes that one would include to irradiate for this patient. And you can see on the bottom, we have fused to that the PSMA PET. And we can see examples where if you were just to go about basing your treatment planning on CT alone, you'd miss. The bottom left, you can see that the tumor extended beyond the inferior border of what you thought it would. Next to that, you see a lymph node that's clearly out of the field. In the third case, you see multiple lymph nodes that you wouldn't have seen on CT alone, and on and on. So basic point is integration of PSMA PET into radiation planning. It really enables you to see where the tumor is and enables you to potentially adjust the volumes that you want to cover with the radiation. Or in fact, perhaps radiation is not the best treatment for the patient if they have too many lesions and they can't be covered. This next slide is similar, but this is in the case of a patient who's already had their prostate removed. And similarly here, we can see that areas that are clearly not covered by the intended treatment volumes based on CT alone, that are revealed by integration of the information from the PSMA PET scan into the CT. Another way that integration of PSMA PET into radiation planning can really make an impact, even if you had already intended to cover the area where the lesion was seen, is that you can actually escalate the dose to the precise area where the tumor is. And you can see on the top there where we are treating a typical lymph node volume, we're treating it to the same dose because we have no reason to believe based upon that imaging that there's a concentration of tumor higher in one place than another. On the bottom, integration of the PSMA PET data clearly shows an area where the tumor is. And we know that in that situation, a higher dose delivered to that area precisely is more likely to control that tumor. So you can see how we can sculpt the dose deliver a more appropriate dose of radiation to the place where the tumor is. Another role actually for PSMA PET in radiation for prostate cancer is identification of lesions that can be targetable with very focal radiation. So there's a technique called stereotactic body radiotherapy, SBRT is the acronym, which enables very precise high dose radiation to areas and the question often is, well, what area? Because if you suspect there is tumor somewhere, but you can't find it, it doesn't help you very much. But if you have very accurate, sensitive, and precise imaging, you can find these lesions. And sometimes it may be only one or two, and you can actually offer focal therapy to that. So on the top there is an example of a PSMA PET scan and a solitary metastatic lesion at the L5. On the bottom is actually a plan to deliver radiation dose precisely to that area by the technique of SBRT. So I had mentioned that clearly integrating PSMA PET into radiation planning can make an impact, but how much of an impact? And so uh, we tried to uh, assess this. We actually looked at uh, 270 situations where a patient had had their prostate removed and then subsequently had a relapse of prostate cancer. And we 
planned the radiation as we would have, uh, just guessing where the cancer is. But in the case of these patients, they also had a PSMA scan. And when we integrated information from the PSMA scan, we actually found that we would have missed about 20% of the time. Um, and what's more, an additional 30% of the time, we would have been able to improve the uh, success of the radiation likely by focal dose escalation to visible lesions. So, so that's quite a bit of an impact actually on the planning of radiation when you incorporate the information from PSMA PET. In the case of patients that actually had an intact prostate, we actually found similarly that there was, there was a considerable impact of uh, incorporation of the nuclear medicine information from the PSMA PET scan. This is a slide that basically summarizes, you know, the, the mechanisms by which incorporation of nuclear medicine, PSMA PET imaging into technical radiation planning can have a, have a big impact. So first off, as I mentioned, the uh, integration of PSMA PET can really reveal areas of disease that you wouldn't have otherwise seen. And as I mentioned before, knowing where the cancer is, staging the cancer is critical to determining the best course of treatment for the patient. What's more, the precise anatomic location of the uh, lesion that can be visualized with advanced nuclear medicine imaging will actually allow a radiation oncologist to more appropriately sculpt the dose, escalate the dose to the area that needs it while avoiding delivery of dose to places that don't need it so much. So it enables a more precise delivery of radiation therapy. And finally, it can also reveal in certain cases the location of isolated lesions that may be amenable to very focal radiation therapy treatments. I just wanted to give one slide about you know, stuff uh, coming down the road, a little future here. Um, there's been efforts to develop uh, artificial intelligence driven uh, applications to PET imaging. One example is here. This is on the left. We're showing a CT scan and a AI segmentation. That means delineation of organs. And you can see it does quite a good job of that. Um, and then in this project, uh, that was a large collaboration, we were able uh, to show that uh, you, know, you can actually use AI to assess the scan itself, the CT and the PSMA PET, to actually pick the lesions out um, and assist a reader uh, in their evaluation of the PSMA PET scan. So on the right side there, on the far right, you can see you know, clear focal areas where the lesions are uh, assisted by the artificial intelligence. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Before we move into the, uh, the Q&A session, uh, I'd like to share a little bit about my own story uh, and my own journey and the organization VPCA. The organization was founded really to help veterans uh, and, and specifically the veteran population to understand uh, both the, uh, the disease itself and also uh, the treatment options that are available. Hello, I'm Mike Crosby. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Veterans Prostate Cancer Awareness. Our organization was founded uh, to help educate and raise awareness around the prostate cancer issues within the veterans health uh, population. Today, there's approximately 20 million vets in the United States. Approximately 9 million of those veterans are seeking care at the uh, Veterans Healthcare Administration. And of that population, there's 7 million that are over the age of 40. So right in that target age of uh, prostate cancer awareness. Uh, right now, we're seeing approximately 13 to 15,000 men diagnosed every year. So that's new patients. And uh, today, there's 489,000 veterans living with prostate cancer inside the VA. Uh, and of that amount, there's 16,000 with metastatic disease. One of the, the biggest issue is that we're seeing a 14% rate of metastatic disease on first diagnosis, which is double of the SEER data at 7% for the year. So when we talk about nuclear medicine, this is uh, typically the first thing that comes to mind when you're a veteran or in the military. And that's not what we're gonna talk about today. The, uh, what we're trying to do is to promote the, uh, the awareness of the new technologies within uh, the, uh, the Veterans Administration. We're a nonprofit organization chartered to uh, help raise awareness and to educate the veteran population, as I mentioned. Uh, but we also try to promote the latest technologies available for the treatment and the cure of the, the prostate cancer. So some of the recent nuclear medicine advances that clearly fit in these objectives uh, and our mission are centered around PSMA PET. 
uh, there, there's been some development through uh, the gallium 68s uh, and also the uh, PSMA with a lutetium 177 uh, binder on there and also the new uh, 18F which has uh, been put out by Lantheus and is uh, now called uh, Plarify. And it, uh, they just finished the trial and it is still though open for any veteran that's diagnosed with prostate cancer. And we encourage anyone to seek that out and, and to have one of these scans because it will change uh, the way that uh, you manage the disease. I can attest to that. I am an advocate of this. I have had uh, now five of these scans. Uh, there's the first three that are listed here, the Axumin, uh, which is in September of 2018. And all these were as a result of a rising PSA in my recurrence. Uh, I then had a gallium 68 scan at UCLA in Los Angeles, and now I've had three of the uh, 18F uh, new Plarify scans, uh, all at West LA VA. And again, it has dramatically changed how we treated this disease and how my care team approached this. The first one was the uh, the Axman, which actually identified a single lymph node involvement uh, that wasn't wouldn't wasn't found on uh, MRIs or on the uh, on a CT scan. The, uh, the gallium 68 also identified the same lymph node, uh, but with the higher resolution And I ended up with uh, treating it with an SBRT because the urologist didn't feel it was, uh, was a good procedure to go and try to remove it. I then had a follow-up uh, after that procedure. I had another rise in my PSA, so another recurrence, and they gave me the, uh, the Plarify. At the time, it was the 18F. They identified two new lymph nodes and actually a very, very small potential uh, recurrence on my prostate itself that uh, had already been treated. And so it, uh, it, it wouldn't have been found anywhere else and we would have kept treating this disease uh, just like another recurrence, like a non, an undetectable recurrence, but we did find it, we did see it. Uh, but it was too small and it was too close to uh, the urethra and also the, uh, the sphincter muscles in the bladder. And so they uh, elected to uh, send me through to a, a new technology called a laser ablation, a focal laser ablation. Um, but anyway, we all of this really uh, did make an impact. And uh, I think that we need to pay attention because by detecting it early, we're going to increase all of the treatment options that one has uh, to find the best one that leaves us with the least toxicities. Um, that the toxicity post-treatment is what all men are worried about. I mean, regardless of, of what your, your condition is or what you're diagnosed at, that is the problem that, that everybody's trying to avoid. Uh, it also, this early detection, we know today that if you detect this cancer uh, while it is still contained, you have a probability of cure close to 100%. So one of these things we, we try to promote is that if you can see it, we can fight it. And so PSMA, is allowing us that visualization of prostate cancer like never before. Uh, it also allows us now to better target with very precision tools, whether that be SBRT, things like the CyberKnife with incredibly high accuracy or with focal laser ablation with, with incredible high accuracy. We can fight and we can target those cancers directly once we can identify where they're at. Um, it also, I think, will allow us a more precise staging of the disease in each individual out there. And that provides us with a whole nother series of effects that allows us to personalize the medicine and personalize the treatment uh, and the delivery options to each different cancer patient. So I wanted to mention that uh, that we do work with Zero. We're, we're a, uh, a partner of Zero's at the end of prostate cancer. And who do we touch? We have a very good, uh, very robust social media platform. There's 26,000 people constantly engaged. Uh, they're all prostate cancer champions. They're all on Facebook. We, we invite everybody to please go to zerocancer.org and, uh, and sign up for this. We also uh, veteransprostatecancer.org is uh, is our website and our new uh, new site on Facebook. Uh, the Twitter, there's always something about Twitter, whether it's a new advancement, a new conference, or uh, someone just has a new release of information. Uh, please pay attention to Twitter, the Instagram, and then also uh, Zero is doing uh, uh, live events and new uh, new webinars as well. So there's one of the things that, uh, that, that Zero does, I think that uh, everyone should pay attention to is also the, uh, the run, annual run walks. There's about 47 cities that participate in this uh, around the country. Uh, they're clearly made to uh, raise awareness and to educate men and 
uh, caregivers as well as uh, physicians on what are the new uh, advances in technology? What's available? Uh, what is the best information to, uh, to help you make your decision? Um, there's about 575 local advocates out in the uh, out across the United States right now. Uh, they're treating on a daily basis or we're engaging on a daily basis about 1,600 patients. So we have also uh, taken on advocating uh, for a number of different issues on Capitol Hill. The Mission Act from the VA perspective uh, was signed into law in June of 2018. It actually appropriated over $100 billion for care of veterans outside of the VA. So all of you that have practices that are implementing uh, the use of PSMA in your diagnosing of prostate cancer and treating of veterans on a referral basis, Mission Act provides that money that's available that was promised to treat veterans in the society or in public sector uh, when they can't get the care or it's not available inside uh, of the VA itself. We've also helped sponsor HR 6092, which was Veterans Prostate Cancer Treatment and Research Act. Uh, this was introduced in 2020, and it was just now reintroduced uh, this week in the Congress when Neil Dunn of Florida reintroduced it. It is now HR 4880, and that is the same name, Prostate Cancer Treatment and Research Act. And what that does is help standardize the treatment and care across the entire VA. Uh, we've also uh, pushed for H.R. 5858, which is Military Pilots Cancer Incident Study Act. That is something that uh, has come up. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, of discussion about why are our military aviators having such a high incidence rate of not just uh, prostate cancer, but other cancers as well. And what we have found is that uh, we, we really need to look at this question. We don't know the answers. We, we can surmise what, what we think is exposure to radiation sources or chemicals or or combat stress, but we don't really know, but we need to, we need to find out. We need to ask what the real numbers are. And we need to find out uh, what we can do because really the, the, the answer is early diagnosis and early treatment and intervention, which is going to uh, allow you to, uh, to cure that cancer that's out there. So that's it pass. Uh, and it was implemented in this year's uh, National Defense Authorization Act. And uh, there, is, uh, there are studies ongoing, both epidemiology studies and, uh, and a couple of uh, uh, studies that are starting up right now to actually look at this, this program or this problem. So thank you to Congress. This is all of the online resources that are available to patients. Uh, zerocancer.org uh, slash 0360. But if you go to zerocancer.org, you can find under resources all of these various web pages that have all sorts of the approved and, uh, and great information out there. Zerocancer.org slash veterans uh, addresses a lot of the veterans issues and will take you to our web page as well. And uh, you can see uh, that there's just an immense amount of information, both for caregivers. So if caregivers are having a having problem dealing with uh, ear cancer, they didn't ask for it. Uh, but they need help too. And we encourage you to, uh, to recommend that they, they get to the caregivers uh, connector page. I want to say thank you to SNMMI for the opportunity to address the crowd today uh, and talk about prostate cancer and the advances that we're making with uh, items like PSMA and the, these new discoveries that are coming out uh, in, in very rapid pace. Keep going, keep tuned, stay tuned, and uh, please uh, keep supporting SNMMI and thank you for your attention and for uh, visiting uh, our Patient Education Day. Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our speakers into the live studio here for this uh, Q&A portion of the session. Uh, as, as many of you know, uh, you're, that are watching now, we conducted a poll before we started this, uh, uh, the entire event or the last couple of weeks. Uh, and before we get to the questions uh, and answers with the uh, with the doctors, we're going to uh, take a look at the results of this poll real quick. Um, the, uh, the first one, uh, first question that came up was, uh, uh, would I prefer to receive my, if you do this uh, PSMA imaging, would you re prefer to receive the imaging report one as soon as you can, as it's read, or at the time of your uh, follow-up appointment afterwards? Um, it, overwhelmingly, uh, about 86% to 14%, uh, it was uh, as soon as it is read. Now, this is significant because we're hearing a lot of reports that uh, the, the patients who receive good news are glad they received the reports as soon as possible. 
But if the news isn't so good, uh, this is causing a, a bit of additional anxiety. I, I know you probably want to have your care take, caregivers there. Uh, and and obviously, uh, you know, I've, of course, due to the Cures Act of 2021, it's the law, uh, but it's causing some problems for patients and physicians. And I would uh, would like to ask the physicians, uh, uh, I guess, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nichols, I, I know that uh, we have been through a number of these scans and a number of these uh, uh, debriefs. Uh, and what are you seeing with the majority of your patients? Do they want to know it right now, or do they want to? Are they willing to wait until they they come with a follow up for a, a full uh, debrief of what's going on? Well, I try to get the information out there as quickly as possible, and you know I I prefer to do it myself and. Um, Often that's a phone call, you know, at the end of the day when there's some time to do it. Uh, but uh, sometimes face to face also makes also makes sense. Um, but this is a good question, actually. That I always I wonder what is the best, you know, what is the best well, one? Now the majority are saying uh, give it to me as soon as you can, uh, and I think I, I do agree a little bit. If it's if it's really bad news, and I know Dr. Branchy, you and I have probably we, we we've gone through this a number of times, and we just walk in the office and take a look at it. Um, I think that if it, if the news was really bad, uh, there are probably a lot of guys out there uh, that would maybe want a bit of a support system around them uh, when when you give them that news. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know. What are you seeing in your experience in your in your practice? Um, I think uh, um, in in cases that we've done so far. Uh, reviewing the uh, results right away was very helpful and i know as you said it's bad news but uh, majority of cases we scanned uh, all their conventional imaging was negative ct scan bone scan and uh, i know as the patients were discussing their families it was something in their mind that they wanted to know the answer right away and in some cases we had patients that had even uh, negative biopsies of the prostate and they wanted to know where the disease is so i think it it was very helpful to review or give them the result right away as uh, much as we were able to do it. But uh, uh, it's not always possible to review the scans right away, but the sooner the better, that's fine. Sure, sure. Uh, the next uh, question on the poll was, uh, how many of you are concerned about the number of scans you're receiving? Uh, and it was really kind of split. It was 45% said, yes, they are concerned and 55% uh, that they aren't concerned. Um, so it, it's uh, actually much higher for prostate cancer patients that there was a number of different types of patients that were taking this poll. Uh, in the prostate cancer space, uh, almost 100% of the patients didn't care. Uh, they didn't, they weren't concerned at all about the number of scans that they were receiving. So hopefully after watching this event, uh, everybody's become a little bit more educated uh, about the fact that these are safe. Um, I, you know, clearly I've had five of them. I think you guys wouldn't uh, keep pumping me full of this stuff if, uh, if it wasn't too safe. Uh, but, but I guess, uh, what are you seeing with the, now that we're introducing the Theranostics and that's a little bit tougher of a, of a mechanism. What do you think, Dr. Branchy, uh, where are we at with the education of the difference now between a PSMA imaging scan and then also the, now we're going to get into the Theranostics and how much of that is, is really uh, able to be absorbed or, or to, to, to take on as a patient? I think, uh, as as you said, these are all uncharted territories and we, we learn more and more as uh, uh, we explore more. Uh, but bottom line is, if we have, an, uh, have a question, a, a legitimate uh, question, clinical question that can be answered by the imaging, I think that uh, that is the point that we, we accept from the uh, refer, treating physician and with, ter uh, with response to teranostic and even other other therapies as we experienced uh, doing other uh, pet imaging like uh, fluorodeoxyglucose uh, where some studies showed that there are early responders versus non-responders and that might be helpful in in, in terms of uh, uh, helping to tailor the therapy for the patients but uh, we have to wait and see the results of more studies to to have a, a kind of final answer to that question. Okay. Um, the last question on the poll, and then we'll get to our questions, uh, question and answers from the crowd today, uh, was, and this is pretty simple. Um, 
it was a question about whether patients prefer doing the telehealth visits uh, over this new FaceTime video or whatever we're doing with Zoom uh, because of the COVID issues, or do they prefer uh, in-person appointments? And the results came back as 68% of the people want to come and see you. 68% want to come into the office and have uh, a personal interchange. And, and I, as a patient, I would vote in that side as well. I think that the, the, this telehealth is okay for getting just basic information or a check-in. But when you're gonna talk about your health and you're dealing with cancer and how you're gonna go to the next steps or what the options are, uh, there's just something comforting to me anyway as a patient just to come into the office, have a cup of coffee and see what we're doing. Okay. And I, I agree with that poll. So, uh, it was just data. Now, uh, Rich, if you want to turn on the questions, we'll, we'll go to that. All right. So here's a good one. How can I find out about what trials are happening in my area? Dr. Nichols. Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, Probably the most comprehensive resource for finding out about ongoing uh, clinical trials is a website called clinicaltrials.gov, and it's searchable. You can search by um, pretty much anything. You can search by disease, you can sort, search by treatment, um, and, and you can look around to see um, what's available. And you can also consult with your uh, treating physician. They should be familiar with that, with that as well. And, uh, and Dr. Brangie, we've had uh, a couple of people ask us, um, does it matter where in the world you are if a clinical trial is going on or say in the United States, uh, can, you, can you get to one of these trials if you're in Florida? I mean, have you ever seen guys from Florida come to West LA to, to take part in your, in your trial? Uh, good question. Um, as you may know, our center, um, including UCLA and our centers, we, we were at some point uh, one of the few centers offering uh, imaging of, uh, with PSMA in the past three years. I had several patients uh, traveling, as you said, Florida, from Boston, uh, uh, from Georgia, all, all over the place. Uh, not all of them, but many, many patients. Uh, and from the vicinity of our hospital, they, they drove to, to get this done. and. It was very helpful. And just to get back to the poll, in patients that came from other centers, uh, for in few instances, we, we did Zoom with their treating physician, and I went over the imaging, and I showed exactly where those lymph nodes are. So it was very helpful for the, uh, for the patient, their family, and the treating physician to, to get this done. But uh, as uh, Dr. Nichols said, uh, that clinicaltrials.gov is a good source to find about those trials. and. Uh, some may provide uh, traveling costs, but for the most part, the patient uh, has to pay for the travel and go there. Okay. Uh, I also, uh, we found a new resource that's funded by uh, uh, NCI and the NIH, and it's a group called Massive Bio, and they actually are funded to provide clinical trial navigators. Uh, and what you do is you call them, you tell them which kind of uh, cancer that you have, what stage, they go through an interview process, and then they help you go through clinicaltrials.gov because even for, uh, for those of you with a physics degree and, uh, and multiple uh, medical doctor degrees, um, clinicaltrials.gov can get a little bit confusing at times, especially if you're trying to read it when you've got cancer. But anyway, uh, something to, to, to think about, and, and I'll, we'll promote that, uh, that, that service for everybody. Uh, you can find them on our website, at uh, uh, veteransprostatecancer.org. Um, also, uh, okay, so since I've got metastatic disease, um, is there any point in doing a PET or just a bone scan, or at, at what point uh, is it, um, do you differentiate which kind of scan you should have or not have? Well, I think uh, this Dr. is a, yeah, go ahead. Oh. This is a good question. Um, it it depends a lot on context, I think, and it's hard to hard to know exactly what the context is. Um, it, you know, it could be a situation where there's very limited uh, metastatic disease present versus a situation where there's more diffuse. It also depends on the clinical state of the cancer. Um, is it naive to hormonal therapy or is it resistant to that? It's hard to get, to get at a specific answer. I, I don't want to give um, specific advice here, but, but in general, 
um, for castration sensitive disease, you're probably going to have um, a lot more accuracy with uh, PET imaging than a conventional bone scan. And, and Dr. Brangie, if, uh, if a guy has a metastatic and it's in the bones or he's got bone mets on there, uh, and the doctor says, hey, there's, or his treating physician would say, hey, there's no, no need to do a PET scan, just we'll look at your bone scans. Should the patient ask him and say, hey, do you know about PSMA or do you, uh, you know, should you, uh, I would, you know me, I would ask, but I mean, I, I would think that it's probably worth helping to educate everybody because this is a new technology that's coming out in the world. So I, I'm just curious about your, your opinion on this. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, yeah. I, I learn a lot from my patients. I think it's it's good to it's your health and your choice. So you better educate your your treating physician, or even on a busy day that we're thinking as a physician about a hundred things, uh, in a short encounter we, it may not click in our head. So it's always good to ask your question. One one thing I can bring up: I was in a meeting and we had the uh, uh, prostate cancer survivors uh, talking to us as physician as a group. And what, uh, what he said, and I'm using it myself, when you go to your physician, it's always good to go prepared. So do your own uh, uh, kind of education and write your questions or concerns that you have. So you have a list available. When you go there on a short period of time, you can ask the questions that uh, concerns you. Uh, and I, I think uh, in this case with metastatic bone, uh, bone disease, as uh, Dr. Nichols said, it depends on the context. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a, in some patients, we, we still see uptake in the bone scans, but PSMA shows negative. And there is a, there may be some uh, areas that we haven't uh, learned about it. And then the, the disease after therapy may still show active uptake on the bone scan, but may not be PSMA positive. So there might, in some cases, there might be some advantage of doing PSMA scan. Okay, great, thanks. Um... So next question is, uh, how can I find out uh, where the nearest PSMA scans are available? Dr. Nichols? Um, I don't know the answer to this question. I'm gonna to defer to the new I, I think I take over. Um, yeah, I, go I, ahead. I, I, yeah, yeah, I did yeah. a little bit of uh, you know, uh, contact with the people. It is, um, um, to my knowledge, uh, it is, uh, available around in around 12 different states right now and as we speak they're working hard to to get it uh, available i can just go over about some areas that i know uh, of course in los angeles uh, some areas uh, like ucla and ucsf they, they have it in, in california some smaller clinics in orange county um, um, i think there is in connecticut um, um, North Carolina, uh, Nebraska, uh, New Hampshire, and uh, so several centers in New Jersey, uh, many centers in uh, New York State, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, in Portland, Kansas City, uh, in uh, Louisiana, I think in Baton Rouge, in New Orleans, and Shreveport, uh, in Massachusetts area around Boston, uh, Maryland, in Baltimore, um, Many places actually in in uh, St. Louis, uh, and I think that that list is growing as uh, we talk. So they're working hard. Uh, you can either contact the major centers or the the provider of the the material if you can access their websites. They don't have a list yet, but as uh, things are moving, hopefully by the end of the year, most places have it. But if you think you're at need of uh, one of these scans, you can find the nearest uh, place to you. I think it's worthwhile to to have a short trip to get it done. Sure. If you're a veteran, you can call us. Uh, you can call me, and I'll direct you to where we need to go or where who's available. Also, if uh, and you go to our website and find that out. Also, I know that you can call Lantheus. Uh, they do have a patient line that uh, you can call in, and they will direct you to where uh, the Plarify is, is being administered right now. And, and actually, they'll help you coordinate uh, into whatever center that you're closest to or that you want to go to. Okay, so uh, so for a post-SBRT patient, do you need to see a rise in your PSA in order to qualify for a PSMA or pet, PSMA scan, PET scan? Dr. Right. So um, 
I'm presuming this is a situation where it was uh, prostate directed SBRT as initial curative intent yeah. therapy. Um, so I would say a rise in PSA or a clinical suspicion of a recurrence. Um, if there's a if there's a clinical suspicion that there's a recurrence or that there's a, a PSA rise that would um, you know qualify as a biochemical failure, it would be, in my opinion, reasonable to uh, to do a PSMA PET. Okay. I, th I think that's pretty simple. Next question. What's the difference between normal physiological uptake and a false positive? Dr. Berengi. Well, normal physiological uptake is, uh, as, as it says, is very usually see the uptake. The false positives are areas that are not considered the normal area. I just give you an example. If we usually see uptake in the salivary glands, that's like a normal physiologic uptake. But then there are areas that uh, I'm, I'm just going in, in, in example uh, to um, DCFPYL or PSMA scan. Let's say if there was a, a fracture in the past or there is some infection in the lungs, it may also cause uptake of uh, uh, PSMA in those areas, and those are the false positives. And okay. Oh, good. So next question is, what is the status of efforts to gain Medicare or insurer approval for PYL and gallium PSMA scans? And then any recommendations uh, as to patient advocacy in support of gaining these approvals? So I'll let you answer the first part. Uh, Dr. Branchi, do you know where we stand with Medicare reimbursements for these scans? Um, I think that the ones that are earlier approved for the uh, gallium uh, PSMA, there, there is some uh, reimbursement, but you have to kind of contact UCLA and UCSF. They can give you details on it. Uh, as for the PYL, it is work in progress. I know SNMMI is working hard with uh, the manufacturers and other groups to, to push for it. I, I'm not sure what the status is but uh, it will help that all stakeholders to, to work together to get this approved as soon as possible. Yeah, and I, uh, I'll answer the, any recommendations as to patient advocacy in support of gaining these approvals. One is uh, that I, I believe that SNMI is, is leading the effort and all of us need to get behind and work in a coordinated fashion to understand what our voice to, uh, to CMS should be and, and, uh, and also put pressure on them to, to make this happen. I mean, um, the other is, if you are a veteran out there, I encourage you to sign up with the VA because it doesn't cost you a bit, and it's the uh, it's the best healthcare system on the planet right now. So it's uh, you can get in and get the best care possible, uh, and it's where the trials are ongoing. It's uh, you know you can see the two gentlemen here, two uh, doctors. They're uh, they're running the show. So it's um, you know it's the best place to go for your care, and I encourage everybody to sign up. So if you need questions or you have questions, give me a call. Next. Mike, if I may add something that yeah, sure. when you when you contact your insurance or other things, that most of these scans are actually saving money for the insurance because if the patient does not need to get a, a unnecessary surgery or therapy, uh, or uh, need a more focused directed therapy, that basically cost saving, and we don't even go there. That how much of the emotional and the other savings for the patient it it brings up. So I think it's good to emphasize in it. Yeah. So, I mean, the next question is, is sort of along the same lines. It's, uh, uh, I'm interested in the availability and Medicare approval of lutetium-177 for treating prostate cancer. I would, uh, I, I would have to answer that and say, uh, you really, it's still in clinical trials, uh, as far as I know. And I think that uh, the clinical trials, there's typically no cost to it and then Medicare doesn't get involved. So, uh, that leads us back to clinicaltrials.gov, and then I think it would be a discussion with the, um, uh, you know, the principal investigator or the center that they're uh, actually conducting those trials at to see, one, if you qualify, and two, if it's recommended, and, and you can have those discussions. So uh, if you need help finding those, we're, we're happy to help, uh, and I know that there's other resources out there, but uh, we'll help you navigate through or we'll point you to the navigators that can, can take you through that. Any disagreement with that, or do you think that that's probably the best way, you doctors? I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to bring uh, that uh, there is a compassionate use program right now that uh, you can contact your doctors, and I think Novartis provides. Okay. 
Good. Uh, in 2014, uh, Dr. Michael Hoffman in Australia started using this lutetium-177 to treat advanced prostate cancer. So 15 months after treatment, the cancer had progressed to all of the inside or within all of these men. Uh, where are we with clinical trials to extend this time to progression? Dr. Baranji? Um, I think Nick, uh, Dr. Nichols probably asked uh, that more, but uh, those initial trials are mostly done in, uh, to my knowledge, majority of the trials done in patients who have already exhausted all sort of therapy. So this was their last resort for therapy. Uh, so if you consider that 15 months is actually a lot of time, uh, but with newer trials are starting uh, earlier uh, before chemotherapy and also a combination of uh, lutetium-177 with other medications, other therapies, uh, I'm, I'm sure there may be a, a very uh, you know, good results from those and then we will expecting to see uh, extended times uh, of uh, disease-free or uh, extension of life with these therapies. Dr. Nichols, well, I think you're in some of these trials. Yeah. So I'll add a little bit. Um, so that's a very good question. Um, so in the in the recent uh, vision trial, which was on um, lutetium uh, PSMA target radio ligand therapy, yes, the patients that were enrolled um, had metastatic prostate cancer that was already refractory to testosterone suppression that's called castration resistant prostate cancer and had already progressed on at least one second generation anti AR therapy, for example, enzalutamide, apalutamide, et cetera, um, and also had progressed on a taxing chemotherapy. So this was a situation where there really isn't um, that much in therapeutic options left. And uh, in that trial, I believe the Median overall survival difference was 11 months versus 15 months uh, favoring the, the radial ligand therapy arm. Um, now, uh, in general, when new drugs and treatments are taken in uh, to um, refractory prostate cancer, they're first tested out in a very um, advanced setting, and then in later trials, uh, marched up uh, earlier in the disease course. Uh, for example, there are now trials testing uh, PSMA targeted radial ligand therapy in um, uh, in patients that have metastatic castration sensitive prostate cancer so that is that is uh, earlier in the disease course and one would expect that you'd see longer um, uh, longer times of durable response in those settings okay so again uh uh, clinicaltrials.gov, uh, a good resource, and uh, and if you're interested, uh, start doing your research. I mean, we we try to promote that um, your health is your responsibility; it's not everybody else's. So if you're going to learn about it, uh, or if it, you've got this disease, uh, you need to become educated uh, in all of the different options, and and work and talk with your professionals about learning what's going on here. Uh, I think one more question, uh, when will computer programs be used to analyze scans for more accurate identification of new tumors and comparison with existing tumors? I think that's, there's some trials ongoing, or I think there's some work going on with that. And uh, I'm not sure which one of you is in those trials, but uh, probably both of you, I think. But Dr. Barangi, I think you're, you're familiar with that. I think uh, Dr. Nichols is probably more involved, uh, but uh, we see uh, computer-assisted diagnosis coming more and more artificial intelligence. Uh, it is a great tool, uh, but always, uh, you know, the human eyes also is a complementary uh, to, to that. So I'm, I'm not sure when and how, but I think that the, the work of nuclear medicine physician and radiologist also is important to, to add to it, but Nick can speak more to it. And, and I'm going to ask a question, Nick, as well, a complimentary one is that when they're doing this AI or this, uh, you know, computer assisted diagnosis, are they, at what level are they cutting off the resolution and how are, and what methods are they looking to increase the resolution? So to increase the ability to detect sort of cancer at a molecular stage. Well, so there's many um, goals with using AI for for analysis of scans. You know, one is to see if you could uh, more accurately and more reproducibly uh, visualize and call lesions as abnormal. And you know, this can be done as like an assistance approach to the uh, human reader. Um, one can also imagine it uh, in addition to reinforcing uh, accuracy and reproducibility, potentially 
you know, extracting additional data uh, from the images that might not necessarily be uh, even extractable by a, a human interpreter using uh, deep learning approaches. Um, our team has recently worked um, with uh, uh, Exceni Diagnostics um, to uh, see if we could uh, develop and test out some uh, such AI-assisted um, reading programs for PSM PET scans. I think I cited it in my presentation if someone's interested in reading yeah. about it. But there's an area of active um, research, and I think there's more excitement there to come. Good. Um, I can right. add one more thing to it. And the one area that is already being uh, used in PET scan is to, to either uh, have a shorter scan time or lower dose and enhance the images by using artificial intelligence. So that might be something that uh, helps in, in terms of reducing radiation exposure or scan time. That's great. Okay, I think that uh, I think that does it for the day. Um, I want to thank both of you uh, for both uh, your service to to veterans and to keeping us all alive, and also for your time today. Uh, fortunately, we're out of time. I think this could go on for quite a while. Uh, it's been a terrific session. I think uh, everybody that's tuned in has learned something today. And the bottom line for me is that uh, this technology has changed the management of my disease. Uh, something to think about uh, when you're when you're going through this process or you're dealing with this disease. Um, again, a recording of this event is going to be available on the SNMMI website or YouTube channel shortly, and there'll be alerts on it. We'll put an alert out on our website, and I hope that all the other sponsors and patient advocacy uh, groups will do the same. Uh, I want to again thank our speakers, and really thanks uh, to SNMMI and all of the sponsors for helping to put this thing together. So thank you again and stay safe, enjoy your weekend.